Hi, this is Simon from Tokyo Productions, and welcome to part five of this series on the basics of compositing theory. And today, we're going to be looking at the different ways in which we can define the brightness of an image. Now, the first thing I want to say is something you might find a bit curious. Although we think we're working with colour images, that's actually something of an illusion. What we're in fact doing is manipulating pixel information that will be sent to our display devices that tells them how to reproduce colour. So on my desk I've got a colour printer and it has four ink reservoirs. When I send an image to the printer, all I'm doing is sending instructions as to what proportions of those four inks to use for each dot in the printed image. I'm not actually sending colour to the printer, I'm simply sending numbers that tell the printer how to mix the inks. And the same thing happens with our video display devices, or indeed the monitors we use when we're working on our images. It's the devices themselves that make the colour out of the numbers that we send them. To verify that, let's isolate the red channel for this image. And I'll do that with this custom tool. And first of all, I'm going to tell it to show us the red channel only by entering R1 into the red expression field and 0 into the other two channel expression fields. What we've done here is to tell our display device to show only the red value of each pixel and nothing for the other two values, which is why the image is 100% red. But now let's try something else. I'll set each channel to take the R1 or red channel value. As you can see, the result is now grayscale, and that confirms the point that I've been making, namely that there's no colour in the channels themselves, there's just an instruction about how to mix the relative red, green and blue within the display device. Each channel is simply a set of instructions about how bright or dark each pixel within that channel is meant to be. So how would we go about determining the brightness of any single pixel as a whole? Obviously we need to find a way of combining the brightness values for each of the three channels, and that's where it gets a bit complicated. The most obvious way of doing it would simply be to take the average of the red, green and blue. So let's have a look at that. As usual in my custom tool, I've set the green and blue expressions to link to the red expression to avoid having to enter the same value three times. So, to average the values, I'm going to type open brackets R1 plus G1 plus B1 close brackets divided by three. So now we're looking at the average brightness of the three channels over on the left here. But there's a problem with this method and that's to do with how we perceive colour. If you look at the sky and we compare it to the full colour original, over here on the right, you'll see that it's too bright in relation to everything else, whereas the green is relatively too dark. And that's because the receptors in our eyes are much more sensitive to green and much less sensitive to blue, so we perceive their relative brightness very differently. But before we come on to the solution to that problem, I wanted to show you a couple of other commonly found methods. The first of those is what's known as value. In the HSV colour space, value is what the V refers to. And rather than the average, it's quite simply the maximum of the three channels. Because the maximum expression only allows for two variables at one time, I'm going to head into the intermediate section of the custom tool to set this up. Under intermediate one, I'm going to type max open brackets R1 comma G1 close brackets. So that's the maximum of the red and green. And in intermediate two, I'll put max open brackets I1 comma B1 close brackets. So that's the maximum of the blue and I1, which, as we know, is the maximum of red and green that we've just calculated. Now, back in the Channels tab, I can enter I2 into the red expression, and now we're looking at the value for our harbour image. This is obviously less successful than average, 
because the sky is now even brighter. And this small boat over here on the right is looking much too bright. So from the point of view of representing perceived brightness, this is not an especially helpful method. So now let's look at lightness, which in the HLS colour space is what the L refers to. To get lightness, we need to calculate the average of the maximum and the minimum of the three channels. Again, I'll do that in my Intermediate tab. We've already got our maximum in Intermediate 2. So in Intermediate 3, I'll type min, open brackets, r1, comma, g1, close brackets. And in Intermediate 4, I'll type min, open brackets, i3, comma, b1, close brackets. So my maximum is in i2, and my minimum is in i4. And back in my Channels tab, we can now enter open brackets, i2 plus i4, close brackets, divided by 2. So this is obviously a lot better than value at reproducing the brightness, but in some ways it's still less good than average. So now I'm going to show you a method for adjusting the relative values of each channel so that when we add them together, they more accurately reflect the ways that our eyes perceive brightness. And to do that, we're going to use the REC709 coefficient values. These are constant values that have been calculated so as to reflect as closely as possible the relative brightness of each channel as perceived by our human vision system. And those values are 0.2126 for red, 0.7152 for green, and 0.0722 for blue. So let's see how that process works. Over in my Intermediate tab, I'm going to use I5 to set this up. We're going to take the red value and multiply it by 0.2126. We'll add that to the green value multiplied by 0.7152. And finally, we'll add that to the blue value multiplied by 0.0722. So over in my Channels tab, I'm going to simply use that I5 value, which is the sum of the three channels weighted by those three different coefficient values. And finally, that's starting to look much more like a true representation of the brightness of our original colour image. The green values are now 10 times more emphasised than the blue values, but to our eyes they now look as though they accurately represent the original green colour. One thing I want you to notice in particular is the blue hull of this small boat on the right. Unlike all the other three methods we've looked at, this new method finally makes that blue look as dark as our eyes tell us it should be. So let's just have a quick side-by-side -side with the other methods, which I'll drop into the right-hand viewer here. This one is average, and here's value, and here's lightness. So I haven't yet told you what this new method is called, but that's because I wanted to give you some extra background before I did that. Now, because I didn't want to confuse you with too much information in advance, I've sneakily not told you what I've been doing with my signal path. On my image loader over here, I've set the source gamma space to sRGB and remove curve. And that's because I want to be working in linear space rather than the gamma encoded sRGB space of the source photograph. And so that we could see the final result as it's going to appear on our eventual display device, I've also set up a display LUT to reverse that and bring us back into sRGB colour space. I don't want to go into too much detail about this process here, because that's a very big subject that we're going to be looking at in our next tutorial. But the reason I'm pointing this out here is that when we perform the operation we've just looked at in linear space, the result we're getting is what's correctly called luminance. If we performed the exact same operation in the original sRGB colour space, it would be called luma. 
Now, you'll often hear luminance and luma used as though they were interchangeable, but they are very much not the same thing because of the very significant difference between computing the operation in linear space as against gamma encoded space. Just to show you what I mean, over on the right here, we're looking at the absolute difference between the luminance and the luma result for this image. You can see that it makes very little difference in the whites of the clouds, for instance, whereas the further we get into the shadows, the greater the discrepancy between these two results. And when we come on to looking at how gamma encoding works in our next tutorial, you'll understand the reason why that is. Just a quick note about the notation for luminance and luma. When you see something like this, the Y represents the luminance. Where the same notation refers to luma, you'll see it looking like this, to denote the fact that we're in gamma encoded space. The symbol that's used to denote gamma encoded space is what's known as the prime symbol. I should also point out that you will often find luminance used to refer to some of the other operations we looked at above, and that's obviously very unhelpful. But a lot of video terminology gets used in some pretty inaccurate ways. One other thing to be aware of here is that some operations that involve luminance under the hood are still using the old REX601 coefficients, which obviously give a very different result. Just for your information, those values are 0 0.299 for red, 0 0.587 for green, and 0 0.114 for blue. Now, there's one operation that relies entirely on luminance, and it's one that you're using all the time without necessarily being aware that that's what you're doing. And that is the saturation operation. So let's have a look at how that works. Here in my channels tab, remembering that I5 is my luminance value that we calculated earlier, I'm going to type open brackets C1 times N1, close brackets, plus I5 times open brackets 1 minus N1, close brackets. N1 in this case refers to my first number control. So if I come to the controls tab, I can grab that N1 slider, and as we increase the value towards one, you can see that we're restoring the original color values. And as we go above one, we're starting to increase the saturation of the original image. So this is a case where being able to leverage the best possible representation of the perceived brightness of the color image is absolutely crucial, because we want to be able to adjust the saturation without the relative brightness of the different colors being affected. And the luminance value is quite literally the same thing as the fully desaturated image. To explain how that number control works, we're using it to drive up the gain of the full color version of the image while driving down the gain on the luminance version of the image and vice versa. And that's because we are multiplying one of them by the number control value and the other by the inverse of the number control value. When the number control value is zero, we're multiplying the pixels of the full color version by zero, and that gives black. So when we add that to the luminance version, the luminance version is all we see. Conversely, when the number control value is at one, it's the luminance version that's being driven down to zero. As we go above one, it gets a bit more complicated. We're applying extra gain to the full color version, which makes it increasingly bright. But at the same time, we're applying negative values to the luminance version, and that counteracts the brightening effect. So all we actually see is increased saturation without the brightness actually changing. I want to say a little bit more about this interpolation method because there are a number of interesting things we can do with it in addition to the saturation operation. For convenience, I'm going to modify my custom tool to bring the number control onto the same page as the channel expressions. And to do that, I'll right click on the tool and choose Edit Controls. I'll bring up my first number control in the ID menu. Then I'll set the page to channels 
and I'll also change the input control to slide out rather than screw. And I'll set the range from 0 to 4 to give us that extra latitude above 1. And then I'll click OK. So the first thing I want to show you is how we can use this setup to create a contrast operation. So you'll remember that our saturation operation went like this. Open brackets C1 times N1 close brackets plus I5 times open brackets 1 minus N1 close brackets. And I5 was of course our luminance image. So what I'm going to do here is simply swap out the I5 value for a constant value of 0 0.5. In other words, instead of the luminance image, I'm going to be interpolating between my full colour image and a mid-grey solid. So with the slider at 0, that's exactly what we see, mid-grey. At a slider value of 0.5, our image has reduced contrast. As we bring the slider up to 1, we're returning the image to its normal contrast. But as we go above 1, we're starting to increase the contrast of the image. And that, in a nutshell, is how contrast works. We can, of course, vary the pivot point by using a different constant value instead of 0.5. I've quickly rigged up the N2 slider so we can see how that works. With a higher pivot value, the shadows are more affected by the contrast operation than the highlights. And if we reduce the pivot point down to zero, so our constant colour is black, we've now got a brightness control. What's nice about this, as you can see, is that it increases the brightness of the brighter pixels more than it increases the brightness of the darker pixels. And finally, let's look at something even more interesting. I'm going to add a blur tool, and I'll pipe my source image into that, and then pipe the result into the image to input of the custom tool. Note that our blur tool has a default blur value of 1. And that's fine for what I'm about to show you. So, in our expression, we're going to use that image to input instead of our constant colour. So I'll just type C2 in there instead. And now, you should be able to see that as I increase the slider value above 1, I'm getting a sharpening effect. And this is exactly how a basic unsharp mask tool works. So you can see how powerful and versatile this simple expression can be, and how it's built in to some of our most useful tools. Technically speaking, for values between 0 and 1, we are interpolating our two sources, whereas for values above 1, we are extrapolating. And it's important to note that these operations need to be performed in linear space, as we're doing it here. So that's just about it for this tutorial. But I hope you can join me for the next one, where we're going to come on to the really important topic of gamma. So thanks very much for watching, and see you next time.